Thank you, Meryl. It's my pleasure to join you today to speak to you and jo be joined by three customers. Mark Wilden from Shell, Vice President Asset Management. Malik Patel from Dow, the Global Director of Digital Operations. And Joe Huff of Duke Energy, the Director of uh, Transmission Asset Management. Before I bring them up on stage, um, I just want to share a little bit about some of the success that we're working with many of you on. So as Meryl mentioned, we're working with maybe half of the, the companies here to, uh, this week um, to deploy C3AI reliability for predictive maintenance at scale around the world. As Meryl said, we're monitoring over 40,000 assets globally in over 20 countries and doing so on various and, and broad scale asset types, everything from aircraft, as uh, the RSO team was speaking about this morning, to cement, uh, vertical roller mills, as the Wholesome team talked about yesterday, to gas compression trains, and the electrical power grid, as we'll hear more about later today. And I may be biased, but I think that predictive maintenance is the quintessential application of AI in industry. It's really the, the starting point of where we usually embark our journey when we're talking about asset performance management and trying to get more value out of your installed asset base. When I have worked with many of you in the audience and other customers around the world, what I've noticed as I go out and I meet with your teams and I sit down with reliability engineers and with process engineers, the data scientists, and we look at the remote monitoring center, or we walk the, the factory floor, regardless of those industries, the, co the challenges there are really similar. Um, you're facing the same pain points around integrating and managing large and varied data sets. Going from site to site never looks the same. Going from asset class to asset class doesn't look anything alike. The sensors are different. The way they operate are different. The regimes and modes, everything is really challenging about the technology and the assets themselves. On top of that, you're trying to win over the hearts and minds of the people. So convincing them to change the way they work driving adoption at scale. It's not just about getting a good prediction and having that 94% accuracy that Jimmy was talking about. It's about getting someone to actually do something about it. And then scaling rapidly, that's been a major challenge and something that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, more with uh, Malik, Joe, and Mark. But how do we do that at scale and go after those tens of thousands of equipment and really make a change in, in the operation, those types of challenges, from the technology, to the people, to the business process, doing so at scale, that's really common across all of these different industries and across all of your different businesses. And I think that's why, one of the reasons why predictive maintenance is that quintessential use case. It is really, really transferable, and it's something that we've actually worked really, really hard on here at C3 to make possible to do with each of you. So with that, I think um, we'll just get started. And uh, I'd love to introduce our, our first guest speaker, Mark Wilden of Shell, to join me on stage. And we'll have a, a fireside chat. And I'm so pleased to, that each of our guest speakers has agreed to share more of the challenges, the details of really this long journey that they've been on with us, not just the beautiful success story and the, the immense value that they've gotten out of the software, but take you through some of the struggle that they've been on so you can learn from that as well. So Mark, could you please join me on stage? Hi, Lila. Good morning. All right, so to kick us off, I know everyone here knows about Shell and um, is familiar with the company at large, but maybe you could just describe uh, what is the scope and scale of Shell's operations? Yeah, thanks and good morning, uh, Lila. And indeed, if you know Shell, uh, for most people, it will be through our uh, distinctive yellow and red uh, gas uh, stations. Uh, and if you're a customer at one of those, if you uh, buy Shell fuel, you recharge your uh, EV at Shell, uh, or you visit our convenience store, you're one of 30 million customers we have every day. Uh, and we have 46,000 retail outlets. 
So that's more than Starbucks, more than McDonald's. So we're a really big retailer, but actually Shell is an integrated uh, energy company. So we explore for hydrocarbons. We uh, run one of the largest LNG businesses in the world. Uh, we refine, we produce chemicals. Uh, we have renewables businesses. Uh, and uh, we trade, a very large trading organization as well. Uh, Shell's purpose is to uh, power progress by providing more and cleaner energy solutions for our customers. And uh, like uh, many in the room, we aspire to be a net zero company by 2050 or sooner. Wow, sounds like a great aspiration. Um, thinking forward to uh, what you've done with C3, I know that um, one thing that makes Shell kind of unique versus many of the other um, industrial companies out there is, is just the broad scale with which you're using AI to improve asset performance. So could you talk a little bit more about Shell's vision to use AI to drive um, asset improvement and asset performance and safety across the world? Sure. So firstly, we, uh, we use uh, AI uh, across the whole enterprise. So we use it in subsurface data analysis, we use it in assets, we use it in trading, we use it in customer-facing businesses. Um, we do this uh, because we think that data can help us create better insights, insights can help us make uh, better decisions. Uh, and uh, AI comes into it, well, first of all, because uh, we do think the technology is cool, but really it comes into it because we think it can make a difference to our performance. And that's why we went all in on the predictive maintenance, to be per perfectly honest. Um, if I give you a scale for what we do in Shell with the, uh, with the uh, uh, machine learning, so we have around five uh, million sensors in our assets. Uh, we have around five trillion aggregated rows of data. Uh, with C3, we've set up 20,000 machine learning models. Uh, and we have two global surveillance centers where we do this work. Um, and we do it, as I said, because we think it impacts our performance. And there's probably five key areas we try and target performance. The first one is safety. Uh, so we use uh, machine vision applications uh, to identify unsafe uh, situations and fix them before they become problems. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, methane, very important to us as a company, and uh, um, AI helps us improve that. Reliability, of course, is the big one that, uh, that we work closely on. Uh, we also use it for real-time optimization, and finally, for inspection and condition monitoring. Oh, it sounds like end-to-end -end asset performance management. Um, if I were to kind of double click on the predictive maintenance use case. I know that we together have gone after a wide variety of asset classes, everything from critical rotating equipment to natural gas wells to control valves. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you've learned in going through those different use cases in that journey? Yeah, so I think the first thing we've learned is the magic comes when you can put together AI experts with the people who know the systems that we need to improve. Uh, and we put a lot of effort into that side of things. And you've heard other speakers talk about the change management challenges uh, already. We usually do that by starting with a minimum viable product. So we identify what we think is a problem worth solving. Uh, we then go out and test, is the data available and accessible? Can we build a model that helps solve that uh, problem? Uh, does the model actually give the results that we want? Um, and, uh, and then finally, we really scrutinize, did that give us the value we wanted? Uh, if all of that is true, we then uh, make sure that we can also embed that in a core work process. What we find is that if we do AI and it's not embedded in one of our core processes, it becomes a hobby. So we really make sure we can embed it in a core process. And we also look at the scaling and replication challenge. And there we kind of have the dilemma between, well, on the one hand, you would like to just build a single model and replicate it lots of times. But on the other hand, it needs to work in, in the business context. Hmm. Um, I love that you're hitting on kind of all of those challenges, the technology, the people, the business processes. And um, when you started talking about how Shell uses AI across all of your operations, you mentioned safety is a really important focus for Shell. Um, could you share a little bit more about how you imagine digital solutions can help make engineers and operators out in the fields safer as you go through this digital transformation? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so we do use AI applications in some cases to make autonomous decisions, but actually most of what we do is about giving people insights when and where they need it to help them make better decisions and perform better. Um, so a couple of safety uh, examples. First of all, we have around about nine, nine, nine and a half thousand frontline operators in Shell. Uh, they're almost all equipped with uh, mobile devices these days. 
uh, and we uh, use those to give them access to the insights and information they need for safety. Uh, increasingly, we're using wearables, um, often to connect frontline staff in the field with technical staff in the back office, which could be locally or could be in another continent. Um, so we, uh, we do that. That's one application. Um, another application is around machine vision for safety, where we use that with supervisors. We use drones. We use CCTV uh, to provide uh, uh, sort of indications of potential anomalies. It could, for example, be a crane lift that's being prepared and the barriers are not in place. Uh, and we use that to provide supervisors with feedback to intervene. Um, the third example I'd like to share, which I think is super cool, is uh, in road transportation where we use machine vision to actually detect when, uh, just by focusing on the driver's eyes, when there's signs of distraction or fatigue and give them an immediate uh, warning uh, or alert so that uh, they can uh, sort of check themselves and uh, again intervene before something, uh, something bad happens. That's for your own fleet drivers? Yeah, in, uh, in 2022, we rolled it out to around about 2,500 uh, um, heavy duty vehicles. I haven't seen the, the numbers for last year, but it was a, a similar dimension again. And we see that it makes uh, a, a, yeah, a large impact. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. I hope you also have had a chance to go try the, the AI vision experience, see how it stacks up against your AR uh, remote operations. <laughs> it's, uh, it's another area we're very, we're very interested in. Um, we do a lot of uh, remote maintenance planning, for example. We have a large engineering office in Chennai, and they work for people all around the world. And that ability to really visualize the actual context of the work uh, helps enormously with uh, precision, precision and accuracy. Incredible. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about retrospective look back. What have you accomplished to date? Obviously, tremendous. And, and you know, we love talking to Shell for that reason, is you're, doing, you're using so, AI so broadly. Um, but if we think forward into the future, right, the past year, I mean, this has been a, a major topic uh, this week at the conference, the past year in AI has been one marked by tremendous innovation and just the scale with which people around the world are now using AI, I think, has changed really dramatically. So with that in mind, could you share a little bit more about what, how do you plan to continue to grow value with AI and what is on your mind for an innovative roadmap as you look into the future? Sure. Um, so first of all, the areas we've used AI, we can still get more value out of them. Um, so we want to continue to tune models, to continue to uh, yeah, drive value out of the use cases we have. We see quite a few parallel use cases to things we've done. Uh, a good example, Molik uh, will be on the stage shortly talking about uh, what Dow have done with furnaces. We like the look of that. Similarly, we're very interested in doing that type of work with wells. We see that as another area where the predictive maintenance uh, um, algorithms we think are directly uh, applicable and relevant, and there'll be others. So sort of keep doing what we're doing, explore some adjacencies. Uh, we're very interested in extending our thinking from pieces of equipment to end-to-end -end systems. Mm -hmm. So really doing more sort of uh, yeah, value chain optimization with, uh, with AI. Uh, and of course, uh, like uh, I think everyone here, we're very interested in the opportunities that come with Gen AI and the ability to use that to supplement uh, what, what we already do. Mm -hmm. If I had to recap, it kind of sounds like uh, you're focused on driving value, and you do so by identifying really good use cases, as we, as we heard this morning, but then scaling and going deep with those same things. And it sounds to me like asset performance management writ large, whether that's predictive maintenance or corrosion or process optimization, and then also safety, two really important parts of shell operations. Um, which allows you to scale and grow fast with AI across shell. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I um, really appreciate the time today. Uh, I think we'll next invite Malik up to the stage to join us for our next conversation. But thank you for the conversation. Really insightful to me, and I'm sure to everyone else here. Okay, thanks, thank Lana. You thank you. Bye -bye. Joining me. All right, so like Shell, I think most people are familiar with Duke, or excuse yeah. me, with Dow. <laughs> um, <Duke's next. laughs> yeah. uh, but perhaps you could describe a little bit what's the scope and scale of Dow operations? Yeah. Um, so Dow is a leading material science company. It was founded in 1897. 
uh, in Midland, Michigan, uh, by a brilliant inventor. Uh, his name is Herbert Henry Dow. And after 127 years, uh, we continue to remain headquarters in Midland, Michigan. Uh, we trade on New York Stock Exchange. Our uh, ticker symbol is DOW. Uh, over the years, uh, Dow's business portfolio certainly has changed. Uh, but the current business portfolio makes up of uh, plastics, industrial intermediates, uh, coatings, and silicones businesses. And we deliver broad range of differentiated science-based products and solutions to our customers uh, across the board in high growth market segments such as packaging, infrastructure, mobility, uh, and consumers applications. Uh, kind of like Shell, you know, we have 104 manufacturing uh, sites in 31 countries. Our uh, net sales in 2022 was $57 billion. Wow, that's a big company. Um, over the past couple of days, you and I have chatted about how Dow has embarked on a massive digital transformation. Um, so as you think about this really big new initiative that you're leading up, what are some of the business goals for your digital strategy? And can you specifically share more about digital manufacturing? Yeah, happy to do that, Laila. Um, so Dow has been on the digital Dow strategy. We are continuing to make tremendous progress uh, on our digital Dow strategy. The, the part of the strategy's intent is to improve our employee and customer experience. And the way we are doing that is by implementing the digital tools and actually making improvements to the associated end-to-end -end work processes. So think about going from innovation to scaling our manufacturing facilities to producing the product, ultimately to meet our customers' demand. Uh, and in order to do that, manufacturing, as you mentioned, is a big part of it. So the investments that we are making in digital manufacturing is expected to make direct contributions for improving both growth and productivity at Dow. So this topic is very relevant. You know, so think about uh, improving um, our, 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 our EBIT, essentially, right? So making more product with the existing assets without making additional investments, so that's a revenue uplift. And then improving product supply reliability. It's a, it's a big part of it. So we want to run our assets uh, without causing any kind of downtime. If there is a downtime, we want to get back running as fast as possible to have and make the product that our customers want and get it to them when they're expecting. So, so the investments that we are making in digital, uh, which includes the tools, the processes, it needs to help us. Uh, reduce the downtime, and in reality, reduce and eliminate all the unplanned events uh, because we want to be the most reliable supplier to our customers. Yeah, it sounds like not just avoiding downtime in, in the manufacturing itself, but also end-to-end -end supply chain and delivery of, of your products. Across the board, I mean, we saw earlier the examples of the challenges that come from forecasting, for instance, you know, to understand what's the real demand so that we can make the product. Everything is tied together. So we are trying to look at the holistically about how do we address this thing, not only by the tools, but also by the work processes. If I think specifically about the work that we've done with you so far, you know, in predictive maintenance for, for, for furnaces, um, something that I think all of our reliability and predictive maintenance customers struggle with is shifting from a reactive or planned based maintenance strategy and, and shifting that to predictive. It sounds simple on paper, great, you know, great idea, but actually making that happen and, and convincing people to make those decisions differently or changing the business process to adapt to that, um, it's, it's not so simple in reality. So could you share a little bit about what Dow is working on in order to make that vision a reality? Yeah, I mean, this is a very critical uh, question here because we are concentrating on maintenance here. So if you look at our legacy architecture uh, in maintenance, it's made up of computerized maintenance management system, ERP based, and your maintenance planning, maintenance scheduling, and APM, asset performance management, reliability analytics systems. All these systems are loosely integrated at best uh, using complicated interfaces, which makes it very difficult to have consistent data analytics, analytics strategy of disjointed data sets, uh, which, which the, and that analytic strategy is super critical uh, for us to improve our assets performance. So we are kind of going in this infinite loop here with the problem that we are facing. So as we were embarking on the digital journey, 
we took a step back and said, hey, what are we needing to address this fundamental problem? And we went back with implementing what we are calling enabling foundational capabilities from an infrastructure standpoint. So number one, centralized, secure, scalable, affordable, and really cost-effective data repository, uh, centralized data repository, to, to have this aggregated aggregation of the data from different systems. And number two was to make the data available, uh, as Mark mentioned, in the field, because ultimately, you know, we want the data to be out there. So, so secure, scalable, and, and uh, reliable uh, industrial uh, high-speed um, cellular network in, the, in our plant for environment, which, which allows us to enable the cybersecure mobility in the field. So having this foundational element in place, now we can actually render the data where the data is needed in the field so, so that our colleagues in the field can look up information such as MRO or an engineering drawing or how the asset is performing to make informed decision where and when the information is needed. The other part of that is that you know, we can actually collect really high quality data, including pictures uh, for, the pur for the purpose of analytics where the work is actually happening. So what we are trying to do is really do the rapid analysis of the problems, uh, reduce the false alarms, as you know, and then ultimately try to get to the point where we make recommendations uh, to drive predictive maintenance. Um, we, are, we are working methodically to go from time-based to risk-based inspection, ultimately uh, really uh, optimizing our predictive maintenance program. It sounds like for you, um, making sure that all of those legacy systems or existing transactional systems are um, really robust and also interconnected so that if you make a change in when a, a maintenance order needs to happen, it actually cascades through the system and yes. you don't have a redundant, say, planned maintenance order that, that is going to happen the next day. Yeah, definitely. That, that is the case. Uh, work processes are really, really strong and we, we follow that. We have systems of record. The reality is that there are multiple systems of, you know, that are doing different things and they need to be talking to each other all the time for the purpose of analytics. Really interesting. Um, I know that you've been working for a long time on scaling AI. Uh, we worked with you many years ago yes. and then uh, came back more recently over the past two years to work again together. So uh, it is maybe a, a long and storied history of AI at Dow. So what challenges have you faced um, in that experience, and what would you recommend to others facing those similar challenges? Yeah, so in the previous example, we talked specifically about maintenance, but then you, you know, add engineering and operations and quality on top of it, the, the problem multiplies. Um, so the number one challenge is the variety of data and the data sources. Yesterday, Nikhil talked about the schemas. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So because you have so many different data sources, you, you are essentially dealing with uh, data debt, mm -hmm. you know, and that is a pretty big challenge. And the, the result of that, so there's the cause and there's the effect of that is that, you know, what's your strategy for data mining? You know, because ultimately uh, there's somebody working in the field and you want to deliver a contextual result to that person. They don't have time to look at 50 different things as Tom's screens were showing, the Siebel and the SAP screens. That's not going to get us there. So how do we say, you know, get all the data, mine it together for a contextual result that our end user can use it to make informed decisions. So those are the, I would say, two big challenges. And from a recommendation perspective, the data repository that I talked about is, is a big part of our strategy. Uh, we are calling it that as an integrated data hub that allows us to bring the relevant data from different data sources into one location for the purpose of analytics. But I think every company is doing that or trying to do that. So the technology is no longer uh, a challenge, in my opinion. Uh, the reality is that how do you govern that? What goes in the data hub? You know, what are the, what are the rules, policies, and standards that is going to govern that, right? So we need to have that end-to-end -end data governance model implemented to actually address uh, the issues related to data privacy and data security. Once we have that, and we have that, you know, uh, that allows us to scale AI first to have the strategy, then to maintain it, and then to scale it. 
I, uh, on, on the point about moving forward with the data you have and bringing it together. Um, I read in the, the Wall Street Journal, did you see this this week, that there's $1.7 trillion of tech debt. I think that's vastly underestimated, uh, but I think you're right. You have to move forward, aggregate what you have, and, and just start moving forward on the AI use cases. Um, as a leader of IT and OT, a combined team, which is a really interesting model at Dow, um, how are you thinking about scaling AI for operations use cases? What type of people and technology and process enablers are you working on to making this happen? Yeah, we definitely took a big leap towards that combining the organization, as Mark mentioned, the change management uh, is definitely a challenge. I think this is a very critical question. Uh, so it's more about foundational capabilities uh, in all those categories. So from a people perspective, uh, think about uh, starting earlier. So as we all know, the data in manufacturing really starts early in the engineering phase. You know, so when you're making a product to building a plan to commissioning and start up to producing the product to, to decommissioning it. So bring that earlier in the stage and drive the, so if you're investing in, in the culture Right, and uh, the activation energy that's required to have a data-driven mindset in the organization. Um, data literacy, so bringing the experts who have functional knowledge about engineering and, and uh, maintenance, reliability, all of that, uh, who know how the data flows through the work process, through the digital thread, so engineering digital thread, maintenance digital thread, quality digital thread, they work hand in hand with the experts who understand data, they're technically savvy. The people who, uh, uh, from our previous conversation, understand the studio and building the models and things like that, they work hand in hand. Together, they are ma maintaining the data in our systems that has very high data quality. The analytics coming out of that data source and that working together ecosystem is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And we are making progress with that part of it. That's the people aspect of it. The process aspect of it, I, we have embarked on a pretty significant journey about four years ago, recognizing that we have siloed work processes. We are a very work process driven company. But if you look at it, it's, it's uh, order to cash, you know, uh, uh, source to pay, manufacturing, uh, R&D, that kind of stuff. So from that, we are actually going from innovation to scaling our plants, right? to producing the product and then demand planning to fulfill. So we are doing that. And once the work processes that are end to end, we are identifying the data objects and where the ownership really belongs. So that puts the work process and data elements together. And from a technology, I think I talked about it, the key elements are um, this IDH uh, by far. We need that. Uh, the second one is uh, the connectivity in the field. Uh, the third one is secure mobility. But but the last thing I say is that we have invested significant amount of time and energy in organizing our asset data hierarchically. So that we have asset hierarchy. Uh, we are continuing to tweak it. Uh, we need to scale it everywhere in the world. But, but that's a pretty important element of our technology uh, um, uh, strategy. So, so those are the things that I would say that is helping us. And uh, your asset hierarchy makes it m much, much easier and faster for us to for, work together. Well, our pilot, it did. Yes. Um, and then, uh, you know, thinking forward, like I asked Mark, uh, I'll ask the same to you. Uh, the, the past year, of course, has brought immense innovation. So how are you thinking about that innovation and what value it will drive to your roadmap? Yeah, so we definitely have a roadmap. Uh, our digital roadmap um, actually is very objective, which is what I like. I mean, it's broken into three key categories. Um, so foundational, uh, transitional and transformational. Much of the things that we talk about on the AI side or generative AI falls in the transformational side of it. And the things that I described about the challenges and what we are doing to have the foundational en enabling capability falls into our foundational and the transitional uh, part of the roadmap. So, so once we have the roadmap, we can say that, hey, this site is ready. It has all the ingredients that it needs to go and you know, start extracting the value of uh, a, a, like a gen AI or, 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 or an advanced AI capability like what we are doing at Texas Operations with uh, C3 AI. So that's that part of it. Well, thank you, Malik. I've, uh, I've learned a lot. I think it's really interesting to hear how much you have emphasized the data readiness 
um, the digital layer as a foundation and now you're moving forward and able to scale really quickly with AI in order to drive that adoption with your joint IT and OT teams. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I'd love to introduce Joe Huff to join me as our final speaker on stage with me today. All right, I think that uh, those of us based in the US are familiar with Duke Energy as the largest utility in the US, but perhaps for the rest of, us, for the, rest of the audience not as familiar, could you introduce a little bit about Duke? Sure. So uh, Duke Energy is a uh, Fortune 150 company. Uh, we are an electric and uh, gas provider in uh, the southeast and mis midwest. Uh, we're sp spread over six states, Florida, North, South Carolina, uh, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky. Uh, about 20, uh, 28,000 employees um, and over uh, 50,000 megawatts of, of generating uh, capability. Um, it's a really broad-reaching electrical distribution grid. Um, and what kind of assets and scale of deployment are you talking about when you're thinking about the, the work we've done together with predictive maintenance? Sure. So we started off uh, in our transmission department primarily with our large power transformers and circuit breakers. Um, the problem we were trying to solve is this equipment is, is spread out pretty widely across six states. Um, health data, test data, inspection data was spread across um, uh, multiple data sets and different tools. And uh, it was very difficult to get a good a good picture of the health of our system. So uh, the, the goal of our partnership with C3 was to aggregate uh, that data to allow us to be able to form a, a picture of health, to be able to better see uh, what the condition of our assets were um, across, across our six states. Um, and how has that changed your operations when you think about what you've done to deploy predictive maintenance? Sure. So uh, if, you, if you look at it holistically, um, uh, as being in the asset management business, it was very difficult for me uh, previously to be able to say, you know, this, see the health of my transformer fleet or the health of my breaker fleet. Um, I'm able to see that now, and I don't have to rely on an army of engineers going and mining a bunch of data and putting together a presentation for me. This is something that, uh, that I can see within the application. Um, we've also driven value through moving to a, a more predictive condition-based maintenance. Um, so now we are, uh, we're only touching equipment when it needs to be touched. Um, there's a lot that goes into managing the electric grid uh, through coordinating outages, um, deploying your resources um, to be able to, to perform maintenance. So uh, if you can streamline that to where you're only performing that work when it needs to be done, um, there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained there. So that's, that's been our primary focus. Um, that, that's why we started this journey, but uh, the ability to, uh, to quickly see the, the health of your system um, and also looking forward to, to help planning the, uh, your, uh, your capital replacements of this equipment and those prioritizations uh, has been really positive. Yeah, that's something I've heard from several other utilities too is how do you shift your asset, um, your capital investment plans for, for your assets and your installed base um, using predictive maintenance, not just um, improving your OPEX and improving your maintenance strategy, but really for, for a large utility where you have so much replacement repair work happening, that long-term capital plan is, is hugely important. Right. Um, Duke has been working with C3 for a really long time, one of our uh, oldest predictive maintenance customers, so thank you for that. Um, but how has your approach to AI and predictive maintenance and scaling these solutions changed over time? And what are some of the important things that you've learned along the way? Sure. So uh, 
we, we started this journey to move from a, a time-based uh, maintenance strategy to more of a predictive uh, condition-based maintenance. Um, so we've, uh, we have seen that. We're, we're much more mature on, in the transformer space than we are with breakers. Um, but we have, we have moved to where we're only, we're only touching transformers uh, whenever we need to. Um, you've, uh, you've heard from a lot of speakers around uh, change management, and uh, I, don't think, I don't think you can say that enough. Um, change management uh, for us, it, it, it's not a one and done. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a new tool that you're, you're rolling out. This is a, a new way of operating your business and it's got to be integrated into your, your business processes. Um, so uh, the attention to, to change management, the attention to who your customers are um, from the the specialists, the engineers that are located uh, geographically, to to the technicians that perform the work, um, to make sure that that they are embracing the tool, embracing the new processes, and that uh, that you're sharing the benefits with them. So uh, so it helps them to to buy in and and accept the new uh, the new technology. Yeah, especially challenging for Duke where your operations are so distributed. Right. You're not just talking about one team that's sitting together in an office somewhere. You're trying to influence people that are hundreds or thousands of miles apart. Correct. Um, another big challenge with, I think, all of our predictive maintenance customers and probably a conversation I've had too many times to count is how do you attribute value when you're talking about issue avoidance? If something doesn't happen, how do you put dollars behind that? Because mm -hmm. um, there, there's nothing there to, uh, to calculate. So how do you think at, at Duke about the value of predictive maintenance and making sure that you're able to justify and quantify the investment in these types of solutions? Sure, so, I mean, we uh, really, to, to boil it down, the way we measure the value of, of this approach is to reduce in-service failures. Um, uh, we're all consumers of electricity uh, we always expect our, our power to be on, uh, and we expect it to be affordable. Um, and reducing in-service failures uh, addresses both of those issues. Uh, in-service failures leads to very long interruptions for our customers. Um, it's also more expensive to address because uh, a lot of times there are, there are unintended consequences of, of unplanned failures. So. Uh, we've we've got a model that uh, that we use to to estimate the the savings associated with what we call good catches. Um, so we've got uh, we've catch, captured about 35 of those to date, um, and they they run the gamut from even from new equipment. Uh, you know, you think uh, with with a new piece of equipment uh, that you're not going to have issues with it. You're really focused on some of your, uh, your more aged equipment, but uh, that's not the case. So uh, we've seen it with new equipment where there's been manufacturing defects that we've been able to catch very quickly um, to be able to, to get manufacturers involved, to get warranty work taken care of. Um, we've been able to identify um, uh, hot connections on equipment, uh, hot connections inside of the equipment um, that we know are, are trending towards failure and we're able to catch those and be able to take care of them uh, to be able to extend the life of, uh, of our assets. Which in today's world with, with supply chain and, and the condition that it is, um, items that you used to take for granted that you could get a replacement transformer in, in 10 or 12 months is now 36 to 48 months. Um, so the value in being able to catch these issues, correct them, and keep your uh, your assets in service for longer, and to give you that planning horizon to be able to plan that replacement is is really uh, really impactful. So as you've scaled this, um, you've been working with us, you know, five six years now. Um, what are some of the things that you've invested in to make the program a success? Mm -hmm 
both the things that you've doubled down on and then things that you've learned along the way where you said, you know, we got to pivot and move away from that strategy? So uh, we've doubled down on the people. Um, that is, uh, that's critical. Um, the, you know, at, at, the, at the risk of just really harping on change management, uh, that, that's where it's at. Uh, your end users can can really make or break you in this space. So we've doubled down on the people, um, investing in them, um, having regular interfaces with our customers, our internal customers, um, to help them through um, the application, to help them recognize the, the good catches and the benefits that we've recognized. Um, some things that we've learned are along the, the data governance front. Um, whenever, uh, whenever you make a transition like we have where your test results, your inspections, your maintenance was typically uh, reviewed real time and uh, then just filed. It could be on a piece of paper or um, maybe stored electronically in some database. Um, to move to an, an application uh, such as the, the C3 platform, you have to have controls in place to ensure that all of that data is being, being uploaded in the appropriate format uh, so that it can be you know, ingested by the tool to, to support your analytics. Um, that was a, that was kind of, it, it should have been intuitive, I guess, but uh, that, that's something that, that caught us. Um, we took some things for granted, and if you don't have that data, that data is so critical in, in feeding the analytics, you have to make sure that you know what you know. Uh, make sure that you know all of your information is going into the, in the proper format so that, so that it can be ingested. Well, I think you can be forgiven. You got started a long time ago before AI had really taken off. Um, I'll close with you with the same question I, I ended with Mark and Malik. Um, as you think about innovation and what that means to Duke, how are you uh, adjusting your roadmap and what are you bringing in order to drive more value with AI going forward? Sure, so uh, we are beginning to look at uh, other asset classes, uh, particularly ones that are that are very data intensive. Um, if you look at transmission lines with all of the, the imagery and inspection data that we have uh, and, and substation batteries, uh, those are two areas that are very, very interesting for me um, to be able to see how we can leverage AI to um, be able to aggregate that data, to be able to interpret that data and help us better manage those assets and, and possibly even uncover things that we don't even know about yet. Uh, I think that's one of the really exciting parts is we think we know all the different failure modes or all the different problems that we can encounter in our business, but there's always something new. Um, and then lastly is the, the capital planning. I, I touched on that earlier. Uh, we went down this path from a maintenance optimization standpoint, but uh, we've got the ability to uh, better form our, our capital planning uh, forecasts so that uh, we can better prioritize. Uh, we have historically been very regionally focused, um, but to be able to, to prioritize uh, your capital expenditures across the enterprise is, is very powerful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Joe. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank, thank you, you for sharing your journey and on all of your learnings with everyone here. Thank you. Watch your, got your. All right, I think that um, our guest speakers shared really interesting insights into their paths and um, experiences scaling C3i reliability. Um, but I'll just take a minute. I know that these topics have been already discussed at length, and you can come learn more at our demo booth, so I'll keep this really short and sweet. But I just want to share some of the exciting new innovation that we're bringing to C3AI reliability um, to our application roadmap. So first is no, no code scaling. So Jake already shared a really compelling demo in the earlier session of how data scientists can onboard new assets and incorporate data, train machine learning models, 
through a low code and high code experience for data engineers and for data scientists. But in reliability, what we've heard and working with Mark, you know, at the scale, Mark at Shell, you shared about how hard it is to scale across thousands and thousands of assets and the number of pieces of equipment we're monitoring, not what that means in terms of millions of machine learning models. So what, what just flew by on the screen really quickly there is our no-code end user experience for scaling machine learning models all within C3 AI reliability. So yes, you can do this in studio. Yes, your data scientists can take advantage of our, our template models, but now our end users driven by the feedback of the likes of Shell, are able to take this into their own hands and do this operationally out in the field. The second really exciting thing that we've been working on is, of course, AI vision. Um, and you know, this really resonates, I think, with Joe, what you were saying about the, just the huge scale of your transmission lines. And uh, yesterday we had lunch together and Joe was telling about how they fly helicopters out in the field so that you can take pictures of those transmission lines and see where there's wear and degradation over time. So as we're stitching together all those different types of data, the geospatial awareness, this example is for aircraft readiness, really resonant to Jimmy's presentation earlier today actually, of being able to track which aircraft are at risk of failure as they um, travel over space and time. The same could be applied to dispersed assets in any industry. So as you're flying those helicopters and taking visual images of equipment out in the field, stitching that together with the um, satellite images, with drone imagery, and then also, of course, the underlying sensor data that we're using for many of these predictive maintenance deployments in order to predict risk and understand what an operator or maintainer needs to do in order to take action, bringing that together with full geospatial awareness um, with C3 AI vision, we think has a, the potential to really change the way that people are interacting with their data and understanding risks across their, um, across their asset base. And then finally, C3 Generative AI, obviously a really important piece of our story. Um, and I've showed a, a demo of this now to many of you in the audience and many of our customers already, a preview of how we're integrating Generative AI into C3 AI reliability to make that change management easier and faster. And so Malik, as you know, you talked about how change, changing people's ways of working and driving adoption at scale, I think Generative AI is really a Fast, uh, a fabulous way to do that and drive more adoption faster, putting more ex expertise at the hands of the end users directly within C3 AI reliability. So we're taking advantage of all of the power of what Nikhil Krishnan talked about yesterday and what his team is doing and bringing that into C3 AI reliability, again, to make it easier and faster just to make decisions from those predictions that are coming from the application. So with that, I'll close. Um, we'd love to share more about our roadmap and exciting innovation and more and more customer stories from around the world using C3i reliability. So please stop by and also come to the breakout sessions. I know e and I and Petronas um, are sharing their stories as well. So thank you so much for the time and thank you again to our guest speakers, Malik, Mark, and Joe. Thank you.